Just today, I received this letter from a woman in Tyler. Let me read it to you. Dear Cowboy Economist, I think my children are becoming socialists. What are the telltale signs and where is the closest re-education camp? This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com forward slash MMT Podcast. Thank you so much to all our early adopter patrons. Your support means so much. You just heard my guest this week, Professor of Economics John T. Harvey, in his role as the Cowboy Economist, and we'll catch up with him later. In last week's show, John laid out for us an easy-to-follow, step-by-step, jargon-free way to understand how modern economies work at the macro level. This week, John talks about the importance of using stories and metaphors, and he draws on historical examples to illustrate his insights. If you're new to MMT, I recommend listening to our early episodes, but if you want to dive in here, let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was a nation of people who, after many years of fighting and savagery, discovered a thing called democracy. These people had finally worked out they could fight with words and decide on what they wanted to do by voting on things and electing people to make those things happen. The people standing for election were called politicians, and the politicians with winning ideas won elections. I know it's a stretch, but it's my story. I'll tell it any way I like. The politicians that won elections were called the government. This government of, by, and for the people was now charged with doing the things it was voted in to do. So it needed to provision itself. It needed buildings, roads, soldiers, police, libraries, hospitals, schools, everything. So the government tried to pay for all these things by asking the people to give it money. The idea being that the government could collect the money and then spend it out again. But nobody had any money. They didn't even know what money was. Luckily, before everybody got too hungry, the clever government remembered it had given itself the power to issue currency. A unique power forbidden to all except the government. No wonder nobody had any money. So the government invited people to work for them, making the bridges and the roads and the hospitals and all the things that the people had said they wanted when they voted. The government offered to hire these people and pay them with its unique currency tokens. Let's call them pounds. Unfortunately for the government, the people weren't interested in working for pounds. They were quite happy doing their own thing. What's a pound, they said. Can we eat it? Can we make it into a house? No. Well then, we're not very much interested. Flip off, they said to the poor government, temporarily forgetting that it was actually of, by and for actually them. That's when the clever government thought of a use for its pounds. The government told the people, actually we just remembered, you can use the pounds we pay you to pay your tax bill. What's a tax bill, the people said. They'd never seen one before. It's an arrangement whereby you give us a certain number of pounds every week, every month, every year, or we'll send you to jail. But but, but we don't have any pounds, the people said. The government solved the people's problem by paying them in pounds to build the buildings and the roads and the soldiers and the police and to staff the libraries and hospitals and schools. Hurrah! And because the government made pounds, it could always pay for anything it needed and could even pay out more pounds than it took in. So the people had money left over after paying their tax bills, which they could then keep in their pockets and use to transact with each other. Why did they transact with one another in pounds? It's because they knew sooner or later every participant in the private sector, aka the people, would need to pay taxes in one form or another. And only the pound was acceptable as a means of payment. Sure, people traded favours and commodities, and they even invented synthetic commodities and called them currencies. But every time the taxman needed paying, he would only accept pounds, and thus the people would have to convert 
at least some of whatever forms of real or nominal wealth they had into pounds. The number of pounds left over after everybody had paid taxes, the number of pounds now held by the people, these pounds they were using to transact with, this total number of pounds was the difference between the number of pounds the government paid out in spending and the number of pounds it had taken back in taxes. This number came to be called the government deficit. And the people loved to have as much of the deficit as they could possibly get hold of and put it in their wallets and purses and bank accounts and spend it and receive it all day long. One day it came to pass that the people needed more pounds than were in existence because not everybody had a job. Good people who had things to offer could not find a way to earn pounds no matter how hard they tried. And given that everything was now priced in pounds, those people had an awful life. Somehow the government had made a mistake. It hadn't put enough tokens into the system through spending to give everybody a job. Either that or it hadn't left enough tokens behind after taxation for the people in the private sector to create the extra jobs needed. Even worse, the people who did have jobs and therefore a means to get pounds began to cut back on their spending and they saved extra hard because they were scared of becoming one of those people without a job and as a consequence the number of pounds being spent grew smaller the number of pounds being earned grew smaller and the number of people without a job grew larger life got harder because the nation as a whole was becoming less productive and the people's standard of living was falling why was this happening well it was a silly mistake Unfortunately, what had happened was the people in charge of naming things had called the people's money the government deficit instead of the private sector's surplus. It was a costly blunder. Because of all the unemployment and the declining standard of living, the word government was the most hated word in the land. And the second most hated word in all the land was deficit. What were these dummies thinking, putting these two words together to describe such a positive thing. Anyway, you can't unring a bell. Sadly, because the word deficit was so hated, the poor innocent people were easily hoodwinked into thinking the deficit was evil by politicians who now needed a convenient fall guy to explain why everything was so bad. And so it came to pass that politicians in office and politicians who wanted to replace those politicians in office would compete over who was going to kill the deficit the hardest. And from that day forward, no matter who won an election, politicians of every stripe queued up to slay the deficit. And every time a politician hacked away at it, the people got poorer and life got harder. And then the politicians would blame this on the deficit and the whole cycle would start over again. As life got harder, the people started to wonder where it all went wrong. They started misremembering their savage origins. Hey, maybe things were better in the old days. Maybe it's not a case of not enough jobs. Maybe it's a case of too many people. Maybe we should send some people away. Let's get rid of all the white guys. (laughs) I'm kidding. That never happens. As everything fell apart around them, the people could at least enjoy the theatre of politicians arguing over how best to erase more of the people's money, and the widespread misery created by this almighty screw-up did lead to a small uptick in jobs for comedians. Every now and then, a person with a long memory would remember that the people's money came from the government, and it could only come from the government unless it was counterfeit. But these people were sent to re-education camps in London and Chicago and shown graphs and equations until they stopped asking questions. It was all so tragically silly. The only thing standing between the people and the good life they had a right to was their inability to grasp the way their money system worked. It seemed like all was lost. And then one day, a valiant podcast rode into town. In your MMT sense or nonsense piece, you uh, quote Larry Summers. uh, So here's some of the pushback. Uh, MMT gives this ludicrous claim that massive spending on job guarantees can be financed by central banks without any burden on the economy. How do you respond to that, John? (laughs) 
How is it a burden to hire more people? It just makes no logical sense whatsoever, unless, as Keynes said, you've been brought up the way we have, and you know he's talking to, the, to his fellow economist then, and that these old ideas uh, just sort of stuck in the back of your head. You you have a you have the wrong framework, you have the wrong lens. Uh, but how could full employment be a burden on the economy? It, it makes no logical sense. A burden is what happens in Greece, in Spain, in Ireland with austerity. I mean, you know, they're supposedly relieving the burden by cutting government spending. And isn't it wonderful in Greece, uh, you know, having you know, 20% unemployment? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that, that's the, he's defining the word burden in a very strange way. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. I mean, it, you're actually destroying the wealth of your nation, leaving twenty yes. percent of of people. You know, yeah. in that such a dire situation. Right. I've told students about that situation in Greece. Okay, let's say that the bank, which of course is Germany, uh, contacts you and says that, well, you're having a problem repaying your loans. First thing you need to do is to quit your job um, because that's what essentially Greece did. Let's put 20% of your population not doing anything. That's going to help. Um, and what bank would actually say that, you know, to, well, you owe a lot of money to us. So I think your, your husband needs to quit his job. Uh, and that's going to be the first step to getting back on track. Anyway, economics is really screwed up, and it's particularly. Did, did you know that neoclassical economists themselves often dislike their own macro? There, there's a, a whole generation now of of these um, over the last probably 20 years of neoclassical economists who really think macroeconomics is a total waste of time because of how foolish it is in how they do it. Now, I also think part of what they do is a waste too. But um, you, you want to try to find common ground. Uh, we need to, uh, at this point, plug the, uh, <laughs> there's that Twitter account, Neoclassical Marxism. Oh. Have you seen it? Yes, <laughs> right. I have. I think, what it, I, you know, I think one of the people you're talking about has gotten so uh, 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 peeved <laughs> about the situation that they've just started this account and then covered yeah. up with these really hot neoclassical takes. Yes, yes. And... and uh, yeah, like I say, I have colleagues uh, uh, who are, you know, well-published neoclassical economists um, who think that macroeconomics was a waste of their time in graduate school. Uh, so, I mean, that's the, that's the situation we're in. One of the Nobel Prize winners this year, um, and of course, you know, that's handed out to other neoclassical economists, I mean, which, I mean, if, if, if we controlled everything, it'd be handed out to post-Keynesians, but um, was... Uh, well, as, as it is, it's... Uh Swedish banker prize, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's right. It's not really a Nobel. Uh, and um, Paul Romer was one of the winners. Uh, and he's a neoclassical, of course. But he had published an article a couple of years ago on how his own his own school of thoughts, macroeconomics, had gone backwards for 30 years. And, and I happened to see him at a conference before the Nobel Prize. I was with him and Rogoff, by the way, on a panel uh, presenting a paper, uh, but um, Mr. Spreadsheet. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I was talking to, to Paul Romer during one of the breaks. He said, you know, I got such nasty comments from people, very personal, that I would dare to raise these questions about, uh, to, to call into question the things that their classic revered authors had done. It was more ancestor worship than it was, um, you know, sort of, uh, of, of scholarly activity. Um, and he actually backed off a little bit because he was being hit so hard. But he basically, in that piece, says that mainstream macroeconomics attributes economic fluctuations to something along the lines of magic fairies. I can't remember how he said it now. Um, but, you know, that, that yeah. really, for all intents and purposes, that's what they were saying. So even they think their own macro sucks. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. Something needs to change. Um, yeah, well, I'm hoping that with all the excitement, with, with, with of course, Sanders again, uh, and especially uh, AOC, uh, that, that really reinvigorated me and got me excited again. It's like, okay, maybe we've got a shot. Maybe the, these things are getting out there. And that kids today, I say kids, you know, uh, up to 25, 30 years old, they're much more open to the ideas. They have not been, you know, uh, they didn't grow up in the 80s where greed is good. And, uh, you know, with Ronald Reagan and, and what was that movie with, um, with the Oliver Stone movie with the, oh, with, yeah. with the Wall Street. It's, Wall Street, yeah, it's yeah. It's named yeah. after a place in America, I believe. Yeah, yes, yes. I, I know just well, not roughly where it is. <laughs> and uh, one more thing about the MMT stuff, by the way, um, something that 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 Randy Ray argued years ago. Uh, I happened to review one of his books for a journal. Um, it's sitting up here somewhere. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, oh, oh, Understanding Modern Money. That's right. And that book, as I read through it, and as I said in my review, it was one of those books where you had to set it down and think, oh, I never thought of it that way. I got to let that sit for a little bit. And one of the things I found most interesting, and this is something that that, that comes up now and then in the MMT stuff, so I wanted to explain it to people, uh, is that the value of money, uh, you know, Hyman Minsky, who is, of course, Ray's uh, mentor, and a great, uh, probably the best known post-Keynesian economist, but uh, he said that anyone can make up money. Uh, anyone cre- can create money. The, 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 the trick is getting someone else to accept it. Uh, and so how, why do people accept the dollar? You know, and, and one of the arguments that has been made is that, well, it's the, well, I just paid my taxes yesterday. And let me tell you, Donald Trump did not cut taxes. But anyway, um, not, not, for, not, not for me. Uh, but uh, the only thing the IRS accepts are U.S. dollars. So it creates a sort of ultimate demand for the currency that gives it value. Now, th- th- that's kind of hard to conceptualize. So let me give you a better example. Uh, I, m- my first love is military history. Um, then economics, then my family, um, and uh, uh, so on down the road. I can't tell you how many times I've made that joke. Um, <laughs> but uh, he, uh, Patton, uh, after Operation Torch, when the uh, Americans and, 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 and uh, British invaded uh, the, I guess, that would be the western side of, of, of uh, North Africa, uh, he was in charge of Casablanca for a while uh, after they had captured it. And he wanted to get some local uh, labor to help unload ships and so forth. And so he was going to give them what they call military script. The the the, the U.S. Army will, uh, well, I guess probably all the branches, and then I, I assume other militaries as well, will pay their troops locally in, uh, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a not a counterfeit, uh, but they, they make up a money. All right. So, uh, and the soldiers can use this in the base store and so forth. Well, he was going to pay these laborers in this military script. Well, nobody wanted to do it. You know why? Because it had no use to them. Um, but when he said, okay, 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 I'll let you shop at the base store. Uh, but the only thing we're going to accept are those pieces of paper that I hand out down at the docks. Uh, oh, my God, he had more labor than he knew what to do with. Uh, so he right. could create a money, but he couldn't get anyone to accept it unless it had some sort of intrinsic you know, uh, value. To it. My, my wife in her um, uh, fourth grade class has Harvey Bucks. And you get a Harvey buck for, I don't know, uh, doing something good, you know, and it, but they work hard to get them. And the reason is because you, she has a whole uh, table of things you can trade in your Harvey bucks for. She's got some, you know, little toys you can buy. Uh, apparently, one of the popular things is uh, you can have a friend over for lunch, you know, kid from another class. Uh, you pay your Harvey bucks and they can sit in class with you and have lunch together. Uh, so anyway, point being. Oh, that's they, a great way to teach it. It's oh, like it's the UMKC. Uh, uh, oh, God. Uh, what are they called? Uh, the social. Um, buckaroo. The buckaroo. Yeah. At, the, at The UMKC. Yeah. Precise, precisely. Uh, and so, yeah, so that, that you'll see that, uh, I guess, to put that in context for people, you'll see that argued. And it's a little bit difficult to imagine what. Ray is talking about, we're talking about the United States of America, but when you break it down to a smaller example, you're like, oh yeah, okay, Uh, that's why people will accept it, because anyone can make up money. My favorite, and and it's not everybody's favorite at all, and there's a couple of people going on about it in Twitter now, they just can't handle it, (laughs) is when Mosler gives the speech and he goes, does anybody want to work for my business card? And, and they, anybody in here want to clean the floor afterwards? And they go, no. And he goes, I'll pay two an hour, three an hour. And they go, yeah. no. And he goes, all right, wh- one extra thing I didn't tell you about. There's a guy at the door with a nine millimeter machine gun and you need one of these to get out of the room. He works for me. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, right, uh, right. And, going, the, and then he goes, the guy at the door is the tax man. And I'm like, that makes so much sense. It's like, yeah, yeah, could, yeah. of course it's coercive. And people on both sides of uh, political identity spectrum hate that and i'm like what's the problem you know there's people on the left who are going what you're saying that people should be forced to work at gunpoint it's like no nobody's saying that do, do you understand right. analogies do you, do you know <laughs> you know it's uh, <laughs> nobody's saying that and then you know and, and uh and, and then obviously the people on the right just hate the idea that there's any kind of coercion there they just think money is something that like if somebody's like really excellent at entrepreneurship it just happens to grow on them 
and right, they, and right. they dig it up out of the ground. Yeah, no, that's precisely <laughs> because right. Because they've, they, they've done entrepreneurialism well, and now there's money, and it's, you know, yeah. so it's, I, I just thought it was such a great explanation of, of uh, you know, why to have taxation, and, and then, and then you know, abstract away from that, what now, now we've got taxes driving money, what can we have taxes do, and, uh, yes. you know, regulate aggregate demand, and uh, uh, incentivize and disincentivize things, and, and right. all of that, but I thought it's a great jumping off point. And, and change in income distribution. I mean, you, you can you can affect the income distribution with the tax with the taxation. So yeah, no, absolutely, all those things. Um, and uh, you, you, see, and, and Randy's been arguing this for a while, uh, Ray, uh, and, and that is that we need different analogies because people have all these frames stuck in their head that are wrong, and we can go through these complex analyses. Uh, I can I can tell somebody, hey, here, read this article by Steve Keen, but you're not going to follow it. Uh, people don't think that way. They they think in terms of these small, simple uh, stories, you know. And, and I my gut fights against that. Uh, and my wife tries to tell me, you know, uh, Melanie says, you know, well, no, you have to tell stories. So no, no, no I just want to lay out the logic. No, you got to tell story because people like stories and they can picture it and they can apply it. Uh, and so, you know, for example, the Mosler story, uh, you're like, oh, yeah, well, that, that kind of makes sense. Uh, and, and, you know, go, go from there. You know, we're talking about people on the right and the left. I find that the people on the right and the left both are OK with the job guarantee. It just depends on how you sell it. Uh, you know, to the to the right, you can say and you don't want to say this exactly, but, you know, get those lazy bastards off their rear ends and get them to work. You know? uh, and uh Th- that part they fill in themselves fairly well. Uh, but then on the left, you're like, hey, these people want a job. Uh, and oh, my God, do, do you have these payday loan places in, in the UK? Yeah, yeah. You, do you know the average annual uh, rate of interest is like 400%? And you know what side of town they're on? They're on the poor side of town. Uh, it's Dickensian. Yes. Uh, and, and you end up with, with the financial sector. Making and I now appreciate better Keynes's comment at the at, in the back of the general theory about he wants the euthanasia of the of the rentier class, the people who make money from loaning money, because money is a false scarcity. Now, I'm not saying people should banks should loan out money with no interest or whatever. That's not the same thing. Uh, but in the United States, they're making all this money off of these college students with loans from the government. And it's a false scarcity. They're paying six and seven percent interest on something we want them to do. We would like them to go do this. Uh, and so I think of these people on the you know on the east side of Fort Worth who are already downtrodden. And boy, have we well, it's like the company store in the American you know old the coal town where uh, it was at Tennessee Ernie Ford. Uh, you load sixteen tons, and what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. Saying, Peter, don't you call me because I can't. Come, I owe my soul to the company store, or I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store because the company store they they they, they charge them so much that you had to keep working for us. Um, so yeah, we're the, the 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 rentier class, the financial sector is doing precisely that, and I don't care who you elect out of the Republicans or out of the establishment Democrats. You've got those Wall Street people are the ones making the decisions, uh, and. Until we get somebody that's a true progressive, we're screwed. It's even, it makes a good business case. It's like, why would you not want the government to provide more and more of these uh, services like education? Yeah. Uh, to make the, your population as smart as it can possibly be, rather than it having to come out of their own pockets and them having to go into debt with it. And then they, they, they come, you know, our, our, this next generation come into the world as smart as they can possibly right. be with all the challenges that we've got coming up and, and no debt. Right. You know, they can, they can build. Right. Oh, my, my daughters. Yeah. Are already, well, one of them's about to start law school and she's going to Berkeley and believe it or not, San Francisco housing is extremely expensive. Uh, and so she already owes from, from undergrad, not, not too bad. Uh, but then, I mean, she's looking at, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to go get a law degree. And you know what she wants to do? She wants to do environmental law and on the good guy side, not on the bad guy side. Uh, so this is a, she's going to do it anyway uh, because she, 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 you know, that, that was her first choice. But uh, nevertheless, I mean, the, but it's a short run, long run thing, I think. Well, OK, now let me go to this. I used to think for years and years that the, the, the rich, uh, the elite class, they simply have a different philosophy of life. And Melanie would always tell me, no, they're just greedy. No, 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 no. Yeah, you know why she was right. 
They're just crazy. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 you know, Cain says this something about in the back of the general theory, but th- th- these, are, these are poorly adjusted people who desperately want more and more and more. They're worried to death that, you know, in their, you know, really nice house, that some poor person's screwing them. Uh, they really are. Uh, I mean, we went to a, a, a party and uh, I don't want to give all the background because it'll give away where it was and so forth. But, but a lot of very wealthy people there uh, and very pleasant people. Uh, there were there were two two uh, African-American men there. Of course, they were attending bar. They weren't at the party. But um, and uh, someone stopped and gave a prayer. And oh my God, Melanie and and her brother, uh, Dan and I all stood there. It was the most unbelievably evil speech I have ever, it was a prayer. I was talking about about Obama, uh, not not directly, but you know, trying to take away our freedoms by which they meant the freedom to to, uh, discriminate uh, against homosexuals and you know, and and, and whatever else they wanted to discriminate against. And it was just awful. Uh, And these are, these are, these are bad people. <laughs> so I think Melanie was right all those years. I don't think it's just like, well, they have a different philosophy. You're going to have to stop going to these family dudes. Oh, God. Let's move on to, it seems to me you like to make economics entertaining. And, uh, you know, I, I could uh, listen to you for hours. Um, it's You know, you make it fascinating. And I, I've got, always got this theory that uh, people have been trying to keep it boring for years. <laughs> That's why they start, when people start actually understanding it, they're like, wow, we can really... We can change our situation here. We can yeah. anyway. I'll put that to one side. So I, I imagine that is the drive behind your creation, the Cowboy Economist. <laughs> uh, so before we go any further, if you're listening, just go, just stop what you're doing, including listening to this. <laughs> Go on YouTube, put the Cowboy Economist into YouTube, and or I have a web page too. Uh, oh right, okay. yeah, I went insane over a weekend, and I had to learn how to. Um, I, I had done web pages. 20 years ago. They're a little bit more complicated now. So I had to learn how to use Dreamweaver. But yeah, if you go and I reserve the domain, cowboyeconomist.com and thecowboyeconomist.com. You put either one of those in there and you'll find right. the link. You'll, you'll find the, the link to go to the YouTube page. So yeah, just put Cowboy Economist or The Cowboy Economist into Google, I guess, or, or DuckDuckGo. Let's not give Google any more information. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and so I just wondered, is there an origin story to that or was it just spontaneously? I, I picture you've just got a, you've got a study there full of hats. And, uh, you just pick, uh, he, could, he could have been like a bowler hatted sort of English gentleman right, but you right. happen to go for the cowboy hat. it's been too long i used to do a very good english accent for obvious reasons um and i it's been too long now i mean my mom still has her accent but then of course when she goes back over there they all pick up on the americanisms um but uh, i can i can't you're all right you know that 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 mystifies americans <laughs> when you say you're all right but well yeah i'm fine what am i bleeding uh and so but at any rate, going back to Cowboy yeah. Accounts. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm just saying hi. Yeah, you know? precisely. Yeah. And, and right. yeah, we say, how are you? But we're not really asking, you know, as you do in the UK too, but how are you? But we don't really want to know how you are. We're just saying, hey. Yeah. You uh, when you, in the South in the United States, they will say, hey, is hi. Uh, and my, my mother was, was substitute teaching at, at a school. Hey, Miss Harvey. Yes, what, what is it you need? Nothing. I was just saying hi. Uh, you know, so all these... Uh, uh, I don't know. I find all that very fun. Um, so <laughs> I had wanted to do a video series uh, for a while. Um, and uh, I, okay, uh, back up all the way to high school uh, when I did stand up comedy uh, for just for the talent show. Oh my God, what a feeling that was. They literally had to open the curtains behind me to make me get off the stage. Because <laughs> once you have, and I know you know this feeling. Once you have everything going, I was making up new material while I was standing there. Everybody's laughing. Oh, it was great. And, and yet at heart, I'm an, I'm an introvert. I, once I'm done, I want to go home and, you know, and sit and, and, and kill people on my computer, you know, playing a computer game or something. But um, It sounds like every, every stand-up comedian I know, and I know a few. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's funny. You don't think of them as introverts, but they, I love the stage. I love it. And, and, so, and I get to get that out of my system when I teach. But I'd also, you know, I'm very passionate, uh, as you are, and I'm sure all your listeners are, and this is going to sound silly, but I want to save the world. I mean, and, and so, you know, a lot of people in this line of work 
Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little side story there. Uh, Steve Keen got me invited to the U.S. Naval War College, uh, where he was going to be the keynote speaker. Uh, they were they were trying to connect to uh, economics, the, the cybersecurity issues. And I ended up at the bar with the woman that runs the whole thing. And I don't remember our conversation, but at some point she just said, well, you and I want to save the world, though, don't we? I was like, well, yeah, that's exactly why I'm doing this. Uh, I picture myself helping everyone. Uh, so I'd always wanted to do that. I, I did the Forbes thing. Oh, uh, let me tell you the origin story of the Forbes blog. Um, I had been at UMKC presenting a paper and I was waiting to go back and the, the hotel had the radio on. And I believe it was Paul Ryan going on, American uh, politician, about how we have to balance the budget. And again, it just made me angry. And I sat down and wrote this long piece uh, about, you know, basically MMT kind of stuff. Um, and uh, believe it or not, Forbes uh, picked it up. The, the guy that's in charge of the leadership page is a Harvard music major and um, really nice, decent man. So, And then he offered me the blog. So, okay, so I'm getting some of this out of my right. system with the blog. But I wanted to do a video thing. Uh, I, I felt like I like enter, I, I like to perform, um, and I I think I'm, I, you know, without any false humility, I think what I'm really good at is explaining things to the non-economist, um, breaking them down. So you know, I, I've given a number of speeches, you know, because uh, again I'm free, um, and uh, so I wanted to do this anyway. Well, so uh, I got all the equipment about two years ago, and then several things happened. I couldn't get back into it. Well, then AOC comes along and I'm like, oh, my God, now's the time. I mean, I, I can't let this go. There's people out there who, who, who need to hear this, uh, who want to hear this. Uh, and the, the cowboy hat, though. So oh, and, and the people going on about, well, that sounds like socialism to me. So that was the first thing that really I wanted to explain to people. My God, the police department socialist. Uh, what you're thinking of, yeah, yeah. yeah, what you're thinking of is public ownership of the means of production. I mean, that would be a, a, a radical change. You know, there's no more private ownership. They aren't talking about that. And ironically, what they're talking about would actually be very good for business. So I've, I've, been, I've been dying to explain that to people. And I also thought it would be kind of funny to do it from the perspective of somebody who, at least initially, um, well, you know, kind of like the, the, the Stephen Colbert thing, that you're pretending to yeah. be right wing, you know, uh, and I don't know why I grabbed the cowboy hat. I, I don't even remember making that decision, but I, I do own a cowboy hat. I was very drunk, uh, let's see, in like 1988 at Billy Bob's, which is, you're probably picturing exactly what it is, um, a, a honky tonk here in Fort Worth. And so I've been drinking a lot and, and I bought a cowboy hat for like $100 back in 1988. Oh my God. Yeah. So, so it's a nice hat. Um, so I thought, well, I'll get the hat out. Uh, and then, I don't know, I kind of like the whole, uh, I have a letter here from a, 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 a viewer in, in um, oh, I can't remember, with Tyler, worried that her children might yeah. be socialists. Uh, so anyway, I just made it up from there. There's, and, <laughs> that, but there's that great bit in there where you, so you make the differentiation between socialists and communists. And and when you go, well, if you think your ch or, or and uh, if you think your child might be a Marxist, well, maybe one way to counter that is to read these volumes, <laughs> and then you point to your <laughs> right. What if you've got three books of Capital right. there in your office? <laughs> when you read these three volumes, digest it, maybe think of a counter argument. I don't know. I'm just spitballing, right. but you know. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, then I followed it up thing. with, but I, I don't think most <laughs> parents love their children that much. Uh, so you know, it's, it's, who's going to sit down and do that? So. But no, I, I really enjoyed doing that. You know, and part of that arose from, well, I mean, I've, I've, th that comes up a lot here in Texas, but we were invited over to a neighbor's home some years ago, a very nice couple, because um, it, it very, very elderly, we were the only other ones with a democratic yard sign in our, our yard, political sign. So they invited us over. Little did we know, they also invited another neighbor over who hated Obama because he's a socialist. Uh, we started off with, you know, sort of polite conversation. His son is a police officer here in town. He's very proud of him, you know, and as, as he should be. Um, and then we get around to, you know, uh, Obama doing all this socialist stuff. I said, well, I'm with you. I hate him as well, but I hate him because he's not doing what you think he's doing. He's not doing any of that. Of what, you, you like socialism? So, well, your son's in a socialist job. What? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, it's from each according to their abilities because we pay our taxes. You know, it's a progressive taxation system, but to each according to their needs. All I got to do is dial 911 or, or 999 over there. Um, dial 911 and your son will show up because I have a problem. Not because I don't have to get my checkbook out. I don't have to get out my credit card and give the three digit number on the back. Um, they come here because I have a problem. 
and he was flabbergasted. Um, and well, but that's okay. So why is that one okay? Why is that form of social? Because it already exists. Okay. All right. So, well, we're done talking. That was the end of that. Yeah. Yeah, the police exist in nature, don't they? Yes, yes, that's right. You know, the, gov- the government can only screw it up. Right, right. Well, you know, and, and that's yeah. funny because... Those, those natural squirrel policemen hanging out yeah. in trees. Oh, do you remember the Money Python skit where Graham... Was it Graham Chapman was a police officer? And he's being interviewed, only he's doing things like stealing people's lunch. You, you fancy a sandwich, and so he goes over to the bench. Just, but he's carrying on as if this is just sort of ordinary, everyday, you know. Uh, well, that's a nice briefcase, and he smashes a window and gives it to me. Uh, but, uh, I, and, and I also want to point out here, my nan once performed in front of all of the Money Python folks, uh, except John Cleese. He wasn't there. Uh, do you know um, uh, Barry Cryer? Yeah, I love Barry Cryer. Well, he's, he's an a, institution. He's a family yeah, friend. He's a nice uh, guy. Yeah, wow. He, they went to the same, he and Terry, his wife, went to the same church as my nan, and my nan should have been a nun, um, so she was there a lot. But uh, my nan also made really nice cakes, the layered cakes. So she made the cake for, you know, I don't know, their 50th wedding anniversary or whatever. Well, you can imagine it was full of, of um, uh, celebrities, including all the Monty Python guys, uh, except for, as I say, except for John Cleese. But then they all decided to do a turn at some point, and I guess I get my performing from my grandmother because she went up and sang a song and stuff, and the Monty Python guys are like, I'm not following an 80 year old woman. Uh, sorry, uh, you know that, that made you <laughs> sing a funny song. So that's uh, one of the proudest moments of my family's life. So <laughs> I love that you keep calling her your nan as well. Oh, yes, it's, yeah, it's yeah. quite it's quite funny in your accent. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to call my oh, mom, man. mom, because she's not mom. She's mom. Uh, so <laughs> I have to be very careful about that. I, I will, if I can say about the, the cowboy economist thing. I've done what eight now? I think eight videos. Yes. Um, and uh, my next one is going to be the job guarantee. Great, great. It keeps me off the streets. I'd really love to get into the um, into ISLM and Ooh, the. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Well, did you want me to do that real quick? Yeah, could you? Yeah, okay. because you, you you asked me that question in the email. Uh, could I explain ISLM? And and for the for the listeners, Paul Krugman, uh, who gosh, so many of my uh, left leaning friends all think is just a wonderful, wonderful person. Now, okay, I'm sure he's a nice guy, but but his economics. Uh, he's like, okay, this is, I don't know if this is a good analogy or not, but there's a wonderful movie. Uh, I think Laurence Olivier is in it um, about these uh, Germans uh, th- that have taken a, a Soviet village during World War II. Uh, and there's the hardcore Nazi. Uh, and then there's the guy that's, you know, he's a, he's a doctor in the German army and he's fairly nice. Uh, he's trying to be, but, but one of the Soviet partisans says to him, you're worse than he is. Because you know he's wrong, um, and you're still doing this anyway. Uh, so it, he actually believes what he's doing is right. So I don't know if this quite applies. Oh my gosh, I've already gone to comparing someone to a Nazi. That was very quick. Um, yeah, we've got. Hey, look, we've been here an hour and a half, and you've only just gone full <laughs> goblin. <laughs> that may be a record. Uh, so, but uh, he is a good person in a bad school of thought. He can't possibly give decent analysis so long as he's attached to a to a model that believes that the economy fixes itself he's never he he wrote a piece uh, co-authored it in uh, i don't know how many of the listeners have heard of hyman minsky that i mentioned earlier but he's probably the one that you know minsky's financial instability hypothesis a minsky moment uh and i i uh did a talk where i was showing how many times minsky has been cited in the main heterodox journals that I, that i uh read the Journal of Economic Issues, the Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics, and the Review of Radical Political Economics, you know, I don't, that 30, 40 times. Uh, he's been in a top mainstream journal once um, since the financial crisis, and only like four or five times in all of history before that, if you don't count the ones he authored. So it rarely, so okay, so okay, well maybe this is a good thing. Krugman's writing an article about Minsky after the financial crisis, maybe he's seen the light. Uh, and he immediately says that the way banks work is that they take people's savings and they give that to people, people who have spent less than they earned, loan their money to people who earned less than they spent. And I don't have time to go into it, but, but my God, that is not how banks work. Banks, if, if that were true, think about this for a moment. The average debt to income ratio would always be uh, one. Because 
there would be just as many people who were, every debtor would be offset by a creditor uh, in, in the private sector. So, oh, so the, so the debt to income ratio can never really go up that much. That's not how banks work. Banks make up money. So that the entire macro economy, uh, non-financial sector, could be in debt to the financial sector net. Um, and it could double overnight. It could triple overnight because the banks can make up money. So anyway, point being that he's operating with a very poor model. Now, uh, what, what the MMT people often accuse him of and what John Harvey said in that Forbes thing was that, oh my God, he's using an ISLM curve model, that even the inventor of the ISLM curve model later distanced himself from it. Now, that, that in and of itself is, is not evidence that it's a bad model, but here's how the model works. Uh, it, it, I guess the easiest way to think about it is that it assumes that people react um, very significantly to changes in the interest rate, uh, that firms invest a lot more money when we lower interest rates, firms invest a lot less money. And by invest there, I mean building, building things, uh, less money when um, interest rates go up and that uh, it affects the financial sector. It is notoriously ineffective. Uh, in interest rates, there are articles from neoclassicals, from mainstreamers who say, gosh, isn't it weird how the interest rate really, when, when we test it, it really doesn't have much effect. But let's not change the model because we all like the model. Um, but uh, yeah, when we look at it, there, there was a piece from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York a couple of years ago about the mystery of the insensitivity of the interest rate. So going back to Krugman, that model on the vertical axis is the interest rate, which is making the implicit assumption that interest rates are extremely important in people's decision making. They aren't. Uh, would firms like to borrow money at lower interest rates? Of course they would. But that's not the sort of, 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 of critical decision. Uh, the, the critical it's thing not the is causality. Yeah. 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 The critical thing is do I, well, okay, let's take an example. After the financial crisis, we have an interest rates at almost zero. And boy, did the economy explode after that. No, it didn't. Because firms are thinking, I don't care if you pay me to borrow the money. If I invest this, I'm going to lose money right now. Uh, so for them, the rate of profit they expect to earn is a much more significant factor than the uh, amount they have to pay to borrow the money in the first place. Uh, and again, they would rather pay less than more, but that's not the big factor. Uh, so, you know, that, that, that's kind of the, uh, he builds his whole counter argument on a model that assumes something that even his own school of thought says is a very questionable assumption. It doesn't make intuitive sense, does it? I mean, if it, uh, just to, I, I'm in the private sector, when I take out a loan to buy, say, a car or a piece of equipment for my work, I don't go, oh, I'm going to hold off for, <laughs> right. know, until the interest rate changes. Right. It's like, I need that now. Would you prefer the lower interest rate? Of course you would. But yes. yeah, but, but I mean, I need a new car. Uh, and, and so, yeah, th that's the major part of it. It's a minor factor that they've made into a major factor and then tried to, to, to make that their, their uh, wedge into attacking MMT. Okay, well, you need to do better than that. I mean, at least, you know, at least uh, Summers and, and, and um, uh, Rogoff were you know, not doing that, although Rogoff got nasty. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I met him at a conference a uh, very quiet fellow, um, and uh, he ha was a, a apparently a tremendous chess player. He actually quit partway through his PhD program to go and make money playing chess. Uh, and then he said MIT was nice enough to let him back in after he decided, but a brilliant chess player. But he's got this whole, we borrow the money and you know what are we going to do if we need the money later uh, kind of concept. And he, I, I don't know. And, and, he, and I, don't, I don't remember what he said in the piece, but it was really very personal uh the ad hominem that you were uh, referencing earlier so kind of a shame yeah, yeah we have a, a raft of uh, uh people who consider themselves left-wing go-to economists who are making the same mistake really and and uh, yeah to use it and, and have resorted to the ad hominems as well and right. uh, or, or they do this other tactic where they don't re they won't respond to stephanie kelton or you or somebody like that they'll wait for an mmt -er advocate yeah. to say something and then i will come back with them with a bunch of equations and right, uh, you know right. tr try and try and talk over them and yeah. uh, you know it's very uh, there's a lot of rude words you could apply to that yeah. i won't do it yeah. because it's a family show john yeah. uh, <laughs> and we have real problems that we can you know we yeah. need to solve um and look at what the world i mean i don't need to tell anyone listening to this what what's happening politically 
I think in no small measure because of our economic breakdown, because of the tremendous shift in the distribution of income in the United States. Uh, and, and now those on the right are, as, as you well know, starving uh, social institutions like the uh, national health uh, and over here like public schools and then blaming them for their failures. Uh, can you imagine if there was a new uh, jet aircraft being designed by, you know, for the Air Force and it was having trouble? They would give it more money. They wouldn't give it less money. Uh, and so, but over here, they're saying, well, uh, the public schools, which by the way, is not true. Pub American public schools are actually doing extremely well. They cherry pick the statistics, but point is they starve them to make them fail. And then they blame them for their failure and starve them even more. And we're going to be royally screwed as we get these, uh, um, you know, sort of right wing movements, uh, and populist movements that we've seen in both of our countries with horrifying success, uh, and I keep thinking of, you know, when we had the, the, these moments of violence here in the U.S., like in Charlottesville, and you think back to Weimar, Germany, and, and the street fighting uh, between the uh, you know, nationalists and, and the fascists and the communists. And I was like, oh, my God, I, I never thought it would be like that again. And yet here we Well, are. I've pointed... I've pointed to some of these things as signs uh, um, on my social media feed, and I've had a couple of people uh, say, "Oh, come on, this is hardly, you know, goose stepping over Poland." And and yeah. I just think mm, that's the wrong attitude to take. It drifts that way. It doesn't drift that way. I mean, people are actively pushing right. that way, and we need to right. we need to push back. Yeah, you know? and that's what I think. I think American youth. I don't know about the youth in the UK, but Amer American youth are really pushing the other way. Um, yeah. You've also got your really weird, you know, the incel people. Um, <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, I, I told my, I said to my wife, today, I wasn't voluntarily celibate for a long time. I said, but I didn't blame anybody else for it. It was because I was really socially <laughs> awkward. Um, and uh, they, they're the weirdest ones to me. Uh, and I saw a piece. Do you ever read Cracked? They have some fantastic pieces. And, and uh, for something that used to be just a humor magazine. But, um, and a lot of satire, uh, but this was from a fellow who had been an incel and he said, I wanted to explain to you what happens and, and what, what happened to me and how it pushed me to the right and how it made me violent and, 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 you know, so on. But, you know, these same, I, I remember reading years ago in one of my military history things, a, uh, coverage from a U.S. newspaper of some Nazis in, I don't know, before Hitler took power. Uh, and today they were like Boy Scouts playing at war. Ha ha ha. Yeah, it wasn't so funny about ten years later, uh, and so yes. yeah, yeah, that that's what you're saying. I mean that you know this yeah. this uh, we don't wait till it's too late. Yeah, exactly, exactly. John, this has been a great a treat for me. Thank you. You're so good at talking oh. about these things. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And may I say to all your your listeners, may the force be with you. <laughs> Thanks for listening so far. I couldn't let you go without introducing you to John's creation, The Cowboy Economist. If you want to see more, there's a link to The Cowboy Economist in the show notes. But for now, here he is. Enjoy. Well, howdy. I didn't hear you come in. Normally, I'd shoot you for unlawful entry, but seeing as this is your first offense, I'm going to let it go. You know, when I'm not whittling or cleaning my rifle... Something I like to do is to help out my friends and neighbors with economic interpretations of various phenomena we see around the country. And why, well, just today I received this letter from a woman in Tyler. Let me read it to you. Dear Cowboy Economist, I think my children are becoming socialists. What are the telltale signs and where is the closest re-education camp? Signed, Terrified in Tyler. Well, let me answer your second question first. That'd be College Station. But to the first question, boy, that's a doozy. Uh, what is a socialist? Is it somebody who wants the social ownership and the means of production? Is it an individual who's in favor of universal health care? Is it that guy down the street that won't take his Beto Yard sign down? Well, uh, probably it's all of these to some extent. But you know what? In order to really get at this, uh, we need to be a little bit more scientific about it. We need to come up with a definition because it's impossible to hunt down socialists without a wanted poster. One mistake people often make in this approach is to define by example. What this means is to say, for example, what's a cow? Well, a cow is like Bessie. Or what's a mountain? Well, a mountain is something like Mount Everest. But then what do we do with an entirely new phenomenon? Like, for example, my wife. Where does she fit in here? You know, 
when I first thought about this, I thought to myself, she's a lot more like a cow than she is like a mountain. Well, I'm here to tell you from bitter experience that that's the kind of logic she rejects and that what she recommended to me was instead that one define a cow by its functions or by its innate characteristics. So I thought, well, that's not a bad idea. So I went and got myself a dictionary and looked it up. Here's the definition of a cow. A fully grown female animal of a domesticated breed of ox kept to produce milk or beef. Well, friends, that's not my wife. And I sure wish I'd read this first. Would have saved a whole lot of trouble. So what definition should we use for socialism? Well, we want to avoid the error of so many others who say things like, well, socialism's like what they had in the Soviet Union or what they had in Korea and so forth. Instead, we want to come up with something more scientific, like our definition for a cow. Furthermore, I'm going to break socialism into two major groups. I'm going to call it big S socialism and little s socialism. Let's start with the latter. Now, looking this up, the best definition I ever found, and as I mentioned earlier, there's many, but I think the best one I found was this. Socialism is the distribution of a good or a service by a means other than income. What this means is this. We distribute saddles by income. If you've got enough income, you can have yourself a saddle. We distribute horses by income. If you've got enough income, you can get yourself a horse. We distribute leather-bound copies of Marx's Capital by income. You got enough income? You get yourself a leather-bound copy of Marx's Capital. However, we do not distribute police protection by income. All you got to do is dial 911. When you describe your emergency, they do not say, can I have a credit card number, please? What's the three-digit number on the back? They don't say any of that. They say, what is your emergency? If it sounds as if it's something they can help you with, they're going to come right over. And it doesn't matter whether you're not even a citizen of this country, you are still entitled to police protection. In short, in this country, we distribute police protection by a means other than income. We distribute it by means of those who need the protection at the time, uh, crime being committed, and so forth. Now, that makes the police department a socialist institution. I'm sure some of y'all are reacting the same way my wife did when I compared her to a cow, but even though I stand well corrected on that issue, I'm right on this one. Indeed, comrade, there's socialism all around us right now. I made a list. Public libraries, public schools, national parks, fire departments, NASA, the United States Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, and Marine Corps are all socialist institutions. I know it's horrifying. Before we dig deeper into that nest of vipers, though, let's step back and have a look at big S socialism. Now, this is quite a bit different from little s socialism. It's a much more specific recommendation that what we want with, with big S socialism is we want social ownership of the means of production. We want, for example, Ford, Microsoft, Exxon, Walmart, Citibank, all to be owned in this country in the same way NASA is owned. And the basic goal here is that we're eliminating a class of people who earn income from nothing but owning. You can earn income from working, you can earn income from managing, you can earn income from directing, but you shouldn't earn income from just owning. I think the uh, uh, easiest example of this is perhaps uh, someone who has inherited wealth. They have done nothing to earn that wealth, and yet because they have inherited, say for example, the Hilton Hotel Empire, then they can receive an income from that ownership. The goal of big S socialism is to eliminate that class of people and have us all own the means of production in a social manner in the same way we do with the Marine Corps and with NASA. Well, that gives us a chance to think about some wanted posters here and to help this horrified woman in Tyler determine whether or not her children are socialists. Let's start with big S socialists. If you're trying to figure out if your children are becoming big S socialists, this is what you need to look for. Are they carrying around copies of the Communist Manifesto? Are they going on about labor being the only source of value? Do they talk about the different stages of economic development? If so, they're probably getting ready to expropriate the expropriators. Now, fortunately, very few of these types exist. But on the other hand, if your children have gone down this path, there's not a whole lot you can do. Why, they're easy to spot, but these are people who have gone through the work of reading Marx's Capital and trying to understand it. It's not going to be an afternoon conversation to dissuade someone of what they've read in these books. So I apologize, or rather I'm very sorry for you if this turns out to be the case.
Now, I suppose you could, if you were desperate, as a parent, read through these yourself and work up some sort of an intellectual argument to have with your children to try to bring them back to the ways of God and freedom. But very few parents actually love their children enough to do that. So, very sad. Could your children be little s socialists? Well, you know what they could be? That's a very strong possibility. But the problem is that pretty much everybody is a little s socialist. Anybody who believes that we should be distributing some goods and services by means other than income is a little s socialist. If you think it's okay that you don't have to pay to go into a public library, you're a little s socialist. If you think it's okay that you don't have to get out your checkbook if you have a fire at your house, then you're a little s socialist. If you think that it's okay for the United States Army to not be run as a private enterprise, I mean, imagine what that would entail. The United States Army would have to operate like an insurance company. They would have to come by your house. Hello. Uh, are you the woman of the house? My name is Captain Johnson, United States Army. Are you afraid of Canadians? Me too. We have three levels of protection against Canadian aggression. And then you'd sign up for them and so forth, and that's how they'd finance the United States Army. Well, we would have lost World War II for sure if we'd operated that way. So once again, if you're okay with any of these things, you are already are a little less socialist. In fact, what we're witnessing today in towns across America, including Tyler, Texas, is actually uh, not a, an argument over whether or not there are some goods and services that should be distributed by means other than income, but which ones should be distributed by means other than income. That's been the argument. Now, these so-called democratic socialists, for example, their idea is not to introduce a new concept in the economy, that is, little less socialism, but to extend little less socialism to things like health care. They believe that things like health care should not be driven primarily by how much money you have. Now, one is certainly free to disagree with this notion, just as one can disagree that the poor deserve police protection. But that doesn't make it an attack on the American way of life. So what I would say to you, terrified in Tyler, what I would say to you is that feel free to argue with your children about this. Remind them that the poor are lazy and undeserving. But don't worry about them becoming card-carrying communists. These are very different things. Now, another thing I hear from many of my viewers is that they're worried that little s socialism can perform a role as a gateway drug into big s socialism. In fact, there's a lot of people out there who equate the two, who say these two are essentially the same. These are either ignorant people or fear mongers. Do not listen to them. Instead, uh, yes, it is true that big S socialists generally also embrace little s socialism, but very few little s socialists also embrace big S socialism. In other words, of all those people who believe that there are goods and services that should be distributed by a means other than income, very few of them also believe that we should have social ownership of the means of production. Uh, I don't know of a single political party in the United States that takes such a position. I mean, there might be two or three people try to run for office now and then, but nobody important and certainly nobody here in Fort Worth. So terrified and Tyler, don't you worry about that. Now, one thing that we do hear a lot about is, again, going back to these these uh, social Democrat Democrats, whatever they're called, um, is that they want to make the capitalist system more democratic with a small d. Now, what they mean by that essentially is to return to the days of Adam Smith the high levels of competition that prevent few individual firms and, and owners from accumulating the power that enables them to, well, accumulate even more power. That's not how capitalism is supposed to work. The invisible hand does not operate when it's got its hand in the back pocket of a politician. That's the right way to think about it. So I hope this was in some way helpful to everybody and to perhaps put your minds at ease. I know I feel a lot better having thought through these issues myself. Will this prevent me and my militia group from worrying about various other issues? Probably not. But I don't think we need to worry about socialists. For now, we've got them under control. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. You can become a supporter of our work by going to patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Get in touch with us on Twitter at MMT podcast or I'm at Christ Riley, spelt C-H-R-I-S-T-R-E-I-L-L-Y. And Patricia is at Patricia N. Pino. 
spelled P-A-T-R-I-C-I-A-N-P-I-N-O. You can also email me at ChristRiley at Outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you. I'm trying not to say that uh, it was a good idea, but I really do think it was a good idea. (laughs) 